Good morning, everyone. I'm Mimi Lichtenstein, and today on Adventures in Luxury Travel, I have on Maita Barnachia, and we are going to talk all about Uruguay. Maita, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Mimi, and thank you for all the audience here joining yeah. us. I'm happy well, to do so. I am so excited for the show because Maita is as passionate about travel as I am, and she has a wisdom experience and knowledge about South America and in particular Uruguay that she's going to share with us today. So um, let's get started. So you, I know, are your family way back when is from Spain, but you were born in Argentina, but spent a lot of your time growing up in Uruguay along with your big extended family. So tell us a little bit about like, you know, what is it like? I know I've heard of it as part of it is like the Hamptons of South America. Tell us a little bit about the culture. Well, thank you, Mimi. I lived a very privileged life, I have to say, because my family is from Argentina and several generations, and I grew up there. But all of our summers, family summers, have been forever with my grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren. Everybody hails to Uruguay for the summer and for our weekends. So I've seen this area developed and evolved as for tourism. Back then, no one came as a tourist. We were all mainly Uruguayans and, and Argentines, and most of my family have a dual citizenship between Argentina and Uruguay. So it has been my place of um, two places in the world. Patagonia, where I'm right now, actually where I'm now in Patagonia, you see this. I'm very surrounded by wood and, and green. We are in our fall in Patagonia, but my other place in the world, apart from Buenos Aires, is Uruguay. So yes, Uruguay has evolved from being a very far away, as you see, it's stuck in the south of South America, bordered by that big country to the, to the west is Argentina and the big country to the north is Brazil. So those are the two neighbor, neighboring countries and the ocean towards the east. So it's very privileged. It's a little bit, I always like to refer to Uruguay as the Provence or the Tuscany of South America. And this part or seaside area that we'll be talking about today is a little bit referred to, as Mimi said, as the Hamptons of South America. Very relaxed, very understated, very, you know, barefoot luxury style. Yes. Well, I know for for those people who have been to South America or perhaps want to um, do something a little bit different, it's such a great destination beyond definitely a little bit more off the beaten path, but um, so many unique things about it. So let's just sort of go through a few of the maps. Um, when you're looking at the country up close as you are here, you had mentioned um, when we were talking earlier, you can see obviously there's a huge coastline all along the bottom, but then there's also a lot of rivers and a lot of lakes and mountains. Yes, the terrain in, in the geography in Uruguay is very undulated. I would say it has sierras, not huge mountains like you would have in Chile or Argentina nearby but it's more undulating and very beautiful. It's where the countryside meets the sea. And then you have a very big river running to the west, nor north from to south, which is the Uruguay River that divides Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. And then you see a wide river at the south, which is the River Plate. It's an archipelago. It's a, um, a delta. So it's very easy to cross from Buenos Aires to Carmelo, which is this area where the delta is, or to Colonia, that is only a one-hour ferry cross, uh, across, and you're in a UNESCO heritage site. Otherwise, you can take a um, three-hour ferry to Montevideo, which is the capital of the country. And it was a beautiful city, like very laid back and stopped in time, but with a great art life and so on. And then you have Punta del Este. Punta del Este is the, the hub where to arrive to all these seaside villages where the most coveted, I would say, point in all of the Uruguayan seaside is Jose Ignacio. Is this peninsula that you see here on the map, uh, which is very particular because you have a very soft and calm sea on one side towards the east, towards the west and to the east, it's all like brave, tremendous waves for surfing, for beachgoers and well, and it goes and all the way all along to the, to the border with Brazil. So we have, it becomes wilder and wilder as you go to the Northeast. And it's really spectacular. What I think is special about all this is the lifestyle that there exists in all this area. Yeah. And we'll touch on that. And what I love is it's such a, 
unique geographical um, attribute that you have this peninsula right here where you could stay. And if you're going with a family and some people want to do, we'll talk about the water sports in a few minutes, but you know, more surfing or high intensity water sports, you can go to the east side and go where the big waves are. Or if people want to go stand up paddle boarding and more, you know, quieter, calmer things, or just enjoy being on the beach, then you just go over to the west side, but you all stay together very close by. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's then, uh, that's a map of the village of Jose Ignacio it's, it's, itself. As you see, it's very small, but it's become this hub for art. I would say an artsy and foodie scene that is very strong and it's very socializing, but in a very, very understated way. Like people don't dress up. They just enjoy what we mentioned before, like the barefoot luxury, like not really the simplicity of life. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, people from around the world had become and established themselves there. But this started, it was, it was first settled in the 1700s. Uh, and then it became like, it st really started growing as a destination in the 1920s. You have these beautiful uh, lighthouse that you were seeing there um, that um, is uh, what divides the rocky point from the calm ocean and the, and the uh, rough ocean. And so it's flanked by these two oceans and it's a rocky point full of life in the middle. Well, Montevideo, well, Montevideo, as I said, is the capital city of Uruguay. It would be your entry point if you're flying from the US and on air, for example, American Airlines has a direct flight. Otherwise you can fly into Buenos Aires and then cross into Montevideo. It's always a great side trip. And Montevideo has a great architecture, Art Nouveau, Art Deco, a wonderful coastline that has all these beaches and residential areas. What you see there is this hotel, it's a, well nowadays it's a Sofitel, but it was the old Hotel Carrasco. And it's in a very beautiful Carrasco residential area. And another picture, you see that beautiful building, that's the Salvio building that has a twin building in Buenos Aires and it has a, um, mm. a uh, beacon on the, on, the, on the top where you can see one city to the other. And that's Beautiful. in the old part of Montevideo that is very picturesque with great museums, art galleries, great food. But Montevideo is also known for the second home for tango, remember? Well, since my um, salsa dancing days in Puerto Rico last month, I'm definitely interested in learning more about South American dancing. Um, yes. All right, well, let's talk about some of the different active experiences you can have, um, or actually we'll start with the culture. So. If you go back, it's similar to Argentina, you have this gaucho culture where you have these cowboys. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about that and, and how people can experience that when they're there. Absolutely. In Uruguay, we have a very strong horse and gaucho culture. So a lot of things that be offered on, on horseback. And you have these beautiful terrains. You have these groves, these beautiful forests of palm trees. These are, you either have the jatai or the butia. Um, um, palm trees that have these wetlands that are really spectacular and are natural reserves. But you can stay in private estancias, farms that belong to private owners and live the real, the inside story of a, of a farm with natural, also great wildlife that you encounter in this part of, of, mm -hmm. of the inland of Uruguay. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're there, we're coming into art, the big contemporary art movement that is existing. Well, Uruguay also ha always had a traditional art seen from the grand masters of the past of the constructivism very famous names like Barradas or Torre Garcia and then Carlos Paez Rilaró later on with the more the more the becoming friends with the Cubists and Surrealists he was big big friends with Picasso and Dali and so on and there's a beautiful museum which was his house in a rocky area on a point another peninsula called uh, Whale Point of Punta Ballena but this specifically this is a Uruguayan artist who became acclaimed internationally, especially in Italy and Europe. He's called Pablo Achugarri, and he makes these amazing abstract and a little bit figurative art sculptures made of marble that have shapes a little bit, a bit human-like or still lights or even like breaking waves. And hmm. you see them in art collections all over the world. But he has developed this first art studio, then an art collection, then a sculpture garden. And now this amazing museum that opened just a few months ago, that is called the Maca. It was so important that three presidents of Uruguay, you know, the, the current president, La Calle Po, but the ex-president, Julio Sanguinetti, who was a great art collector and lover, donated his collection to the museum. And then wow. even uh, Jose Mujica, which was the, you know, the extreme opposite 
um, political side of Uruguay. So it was very nice to see all these people coming together to this great opening. And it's a uh, destination in itself. This is in Manantial, it's very near Jose Ignacio, which we just saw. It's one of those lovely seaside villages. Mm -hmm. And it's become like in that area, we have that, this beautiful sculpture garden. We have this, um, the, the art collection, also contemporary exhibitions. It was inaugurated by an exhibition by Cristo. Cristo was the one, you know, there was a belated uh, exhibition in Paris a few months ago that they wrapped the art, Arch of Triumph in Paris. Yeah. And, well, that's, that's Cristo or the bridges or, you know, these islands, uh, that's what was very famous for. But there's a big sculpture garden, very beautiful, that surrounds this contraption. And that building was built by Carlos Ott, a great architect uh, that we will hear about later as well. This, mm -hmm. this is Casa Pueblo. This is another beautiful art museum nowadays. It was the house of this wonderful Uruguayan artist, probably the most famous because of his personality. And as I, it's, he was called Carlos Paez Villaró. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. But he is like uh, cherished by everybody. He had this charming personality. We would do great things there. He built this museum to be his house. It started with a shack with woods, but then he created like a sand castle that could be, but it's mm. um, all white. It could be in the Mediterranean or Mykonos. But what I find amazing about this too is that apart from his art collection, which you can visit and is wonderful, uh, in Uruguay, you have the most incredible sunsets. You can see there that this, this falls on a cliff into the ocean, into the sea. And what you do there is there's this, um, the carnivals have these wonderful candombi drummers that take place and you have these ceremonies of the drummers coming down the hill. There's a big pit of fire and he would always recite his ode to the sunset, um, a poem mm. that he would do it always there. Now he passed away, but the interesting thing is that people go there to watch the sunset and there's a recording of his voice with his poem to the Ode of the Sunset. It's really a that, very special place in Europe as well. That's amazing. Well, I'll say a couple things. I know when you and I were talking in the last week to hear about um, almost the culture surrounding the sunset experience with the people there was so fun. Um, tell us a little bit more about, so if you're driving down the road or you're nearby and you know the sun's about to set, what happens? Absolutely. I grew up with that, that sense in our family, but in everybody around. It's like you would follow the sun in your while. You change uh, beaches where you go, uh, depending on the time of day. But at sunset, you have to have your decision. And even if you don't have it, you always think you have to stop the car and decide if you're with your family, with children, whoever, where are you going to enjoy the sunset? Because I've never seen sunsets as beautiful as in Uruguay. The sunsets on the sea and the sky turns completely orange and red. And the minute that the sun meets the ocean, it's like very invigorating. I know people just stop and clap and applaud for the sunset. You know, the last green ray of light that some people seem to see the minute that the sun sets over the ocean. So yeah. you really do that. You, you buy something to eat because our Uruguayans and Argentines always sip this, this drink, the national drink that is the mate made of mate leaves. So mm. you, you would have a drink of mate with some really, you know, really good um, uh, in, uh, what we call the media lunas, which are the local croissants or whatever it is, mm -hmm. but you will stop somewhere to buy something to eat and enjoy the sunset in nature, you know, in one of the wonderful love beaches that have this, this views. I love it. And for people who have been to Barcelona before, many people say that Casa Pueblo is very Gaudi like in its, in its architecture. Um, exactly. Okay, then what, have... uh, Carlos would say is that he made it like a sand castle. You know, when you drip yeah. uh, sand, it starts forming shapes, and that's how he was. He kept developing this this and I, uh, okay. building. So far, obviously, we've seen very different architecture so far in the show, um, and we're going to touch on some more. It is a beautiful place with such diverse types of architecture that I think anybody who is interested in that kind of um, thing, it would be a great destination just to see all the different types of buildings. And then we um, continue on with the contemporary culture of watching sunsets and going to beach clubs or, um, or beach bars. And would you say, is this all along the coast or is it more centered around yes. um, Jose Ignacio? This is all around the beach coast. We have beach clubs and beach bars that are very picturesque and very like raw and rugged and, and, and real. Uh, I think the first ones to develop this was a great chef called Francis Malman who put this area or more, more so Jose Ignacio on the map. 
And you will find these, we call them paradors, where you have great drinks and, and, and people just go either to beach clubs that are a bit more sophisticated to, or simple beach bars like this one you see on the photograph. Mm -hmm. Beautiful and so fun, right? For summertime, nothing beats yeah. just sort of having that barefoot luxury experience. Um, so active, a lot, Uruguay obviously has a large coast. So a lot of the active adventures center on being in the water. Um, surfing, great picture here of people on some waves. As far as, we'll touch on later, kind of the best time of year to be there, but is surfing something that is done concentrated period of time in your summertime, which obviously would be opposite of ours, January, February? Well, this actually happens year round, but most people, you know, uh, travelers go in our summer, spring and fall as well. And yes, surfing takes place in all those beaches that we said have rough ocean that are to the east of the peninsulas, because you have several peninsulas in in. But one that we're talking about now is Jose Ignacio. So here, yes. And there's also that we do like surf uh, itineraries. You know, you go surfing from one beach to the other and biking, either mountain biking or hiking from lighthouse to lighthouse and where you have different surf uh, experiences. The ones, there's one little beach hotel called Posada Don Pepe that is like a tower in an area made by an architect and, and intervened by artists of the area where it's mm. the perfect place for, for surf lovers. But you have a surf school in every little beach then, and that are it's great for beginners or for real. And then you have kite surfing. Kite surfing is a big thing. This is in Laguna Garzón. You have that strip of sand that you see in the back. It's one of my favorite beaches in the whole area because you have this lovely little restaurant that you can only arrive by boat and you have to have a previous invitation or a register for, for a reservation. And you cross over by a boat and it's uh, you're surrounded on one side, you have the open ocean, the South Atlantic, and on the other side, a fresh or brackish water lagoon where you have all these uh, kite surfers that look like butterflies in the sky. And it's also, yeah. there's a school for beginners or for people who have already experienced it. And it's just so much fun to learn. Also for anybody who likes sailing, we have these um, activities which who teach you how to learn to read the winds and maneuver a boat. And those, those are great classes have, that have to do with all these outdoor sports. Absolutely. And for, you know, many of my clients have teenagers, college kids who they take on vacation. So all of these things would be appealing to them. And I personally... But you know, sorry, I, Mimi, that for kite surfing, you can do it. You can have classes for seven-year-olds to 80-somethings. That's what we yes. had. Well, and my family has taken kite surfing lessons before, which I watched. Um, I did not partake in. It's very hard to learn. So you have to dedicate your time to it. But... I personally love just sitting on the beach watching the kites go back and forth. Like it, like you said, it's like butterflies and they're all different colors and it looks so beautiful and the people are so skilled and make it look so easy and it's not, mm -hmm. um, but it's just fun to simply watch it from the beach. And this is beautiful. So paddle boarding, which you can do on the calm part of the sea or in one of the lagoons. Um, for those people who are listening, this is a photo of a guy out paddle boarding with his dog on his paddle board, which I actually do with my dog here in New Hampshire on the Connecticut River in the summertime. Such a fun way to be out and about with your pet for sure. It's and very then it's much fun. And that guy that you see in the picture, his wife is the great yoga teacher. That oh, okay. One of the great hotels of Valle Vic that you have the all this the yoga shack. She's a teacher and she's amazing and he's wonderful too. So he does these back by uh, paddle boarding, as you said, in the lagoons and in the soft part of the oceans, and, and the horse riding. Horse riding. So there's lots of different types of horse riding. Tell us a little bit about the different options. Yes. Well, this is one of my favorites because you can go horse ride, um, riding with this Aras Godiva that belongs to Caroline Malman. She has a great stud with wonderful horses and what you do is also you go through the all these barren beaches that go on forever and you can die and combine them with sunset or even with a full moonlight when you go and, and ride horses on the beach and and okay. finalize with this great way of cooking over fire we call asados in our part of the world and it's just a magical evening it can also be done on, on daylight like this one but it's beautiful you go through the sand dunes and all those olive i said boulders these um, palm trees that I mentioned that grow near the, the countryside, near the beach, and then you combine it with the beach itself. Love it. And then the next option is polo. Polo lessons are watching polo. I happen to have a 16-year-old son who learned to play polo last year. Um, he's not been playing it actively, but I saw lots of fun pictures of him learning to play it. And I think for anybody who might 
have had an interest in riding um, and playing polo before, it would be a great thing to try out to see how much you like it. Absolutely. Uh, polo is a big thing. As you know, Argentina has the best polo players, the best horses in the world. But Uruguay is second to that. Uh, there's some great polo clubs and polo farms. This one exactly that you see on the, on the picture is Estancia Vic, which is a hotel in itself. So there you go and can go and take polo lessons or immerse in the polo scene and go and watch the a polo um, match and meet the meet the the polo players who are always so well known for being so good looking and charming. Yes, I've seen photos. They do look good looking and charming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So and then golf. We just touch on golf, but there are some beautiful golf courses. So if you have golfers on your trip, um, getting out there and um, taking in 18 holes would be also another option. And then more amazing the golf courses, I have to say, Mimi, all, all around. The newest one is this Tajamar on, by a great development by uh, well, uh, this uh, businessman called Alejandro Bulgeroni, who also developed wineries and other things in the area. But that's an amazing, amazing new golf course. But there also the traditional ones, Cante Gris, Laguna de Sauce, La, uh, the La Barra Golf Club. For anywhere in Uruguay, you can go and play wonderful golf near the ocean. And you know, um, Maita, what that makes me think of sometimes I have couples who go away on a golf trip, but they sometimes they're all golfers and sometimes they're not. So if you have several couples you're going away with and half of them play golf and the others don't, it would be great to be in a place like Uruguay where there is so much to do for the non-golfers while the golfers are out on the golf course. Exactly. I think all this areas of a um, lifestyle, it has great lifestyle, a great culinary wine, and art scene. So you can combine culture with nature, with wildlife, with adventure sports. This that you see on this photograph is one of the typical meandering streams that flow into the ocean and form these beautiful outlets which you, where you have incredible bird life. You, have, you can spend sunsets or picnics there by the beach with um, full of seagulls and oyster catchers. But in the meantime, you can row in a canoe or take a boat this exactly is the Baliza stream that is formed. There is a great um, hill called the Buena Vista Hill, now the beautiful view hill, from where you have these incredible sand dunes that are great for sandboarding. But then you board a boat, and you can either do these in the evenings where you can go shrimp fishing with the local fishermen and catch the catch of the day, or you go on the boat all the way, all along this, uh, this beautiful stream, and it's very pastoral, very bucolic, very rural. So you see cattle and horses and also some ostriches, are the rias that are the local ostrich of South America. And you okay. come to the end of the stream and there's a beautiful lagoon. And there, uh, again, great for bird watchers and bird life. But there's also a very unique forest of bamboo trees that are only found in this part of the world. Mm. It's really a very beautiful nature reserve. I love it. Well, last week I was in Belize with my family and we went fishing as we often do because my son loves to fish. And uh, before we got there, I think he really only as far as fish ate, ate salmon and tuna. And we caught both grouper um, and red snapper. And when someone catches it themselves to have somebody prepare it for you that evening, he was a lot more apt to try some new fish since he had been helping catch them. So um, for people who are maybe who have kids. I mean, I've never been shrimping. That sounds like such a fun afternoon experience to then go back and, and eat those for dinner. Yes, actually, it's wonderful to go for the shrimp and the crab. And also you go out and fish from the, from those seaside um, uh, beaches. You fish for cod and drumfish. And you have also the Corvina Blanca, the Corvina Negra, the sole, the lisa. And then you eat it at night. I mean, all these, this ceremony of fire cooking is, well, I think, there's where you're coming now, culinary and wine. Yes, magical. So let's start with wine. Uh, for people who haven't had Uruguayan wine, go to your local wine store and buy some. You'll love it. Um, there are a lot of different wineries all through Uruguay, mostly concentrated in the south. Do you want to tell us about, you know, what what are their main production or what are their most famous wines? Well, in Uruguay, as, as each country, at least in our part of the world, each country develops a very special grape that they're known for. Like Argentina has the Malbec and, and Chile has the Carmenera. Well, Uruguay has the Tanat, T-A-N-N-A-T. It's a wonderful wine. All what you see marked in green are the different wine regions. So you see it goes all along the coast, starting 
from Carmelo and Colonia and Canelones near Montevideo and, and all the way to Jose Ignacio and beyond. And then you also have a wine range up in the north in the border with Brazil and also along the Uruguay River that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a great wine region, not only Kitanat, then you have like great Pinot Noirs, you have great um, um, Alvarinho is another grape that is very, very much from the area. But you have, of course, all the other, all the other varieties as well. But what I see that it's, it's a beautiful rolling hill countryside full of vineyards and big mm. wineries and small boutique wineries to visit. And here's well, just an Bodega Garzón. Yeah. Tell us about that's this one. That's the most famous one. Yeah, that's the most famous one because it has won two years in a row. Uh, the award for the best new winery in the world. And it's really an amazing development by Alejandro Bulgenoni, an Argentine businessman who really discovered this area years ago. And he not only developed the wine, but also the uh, olive tree plantations and great mm. olive oil and um, the golf course. And now there has a great development called Costa Garzón, where there's a lovely um, beachside little restaurant there as, as well. But this mm. one has a great, as you see there, the winery up on the hill. It's an mm -hmm. amazingly uh, designed winery and a great restaurant by the best chef, by Francis Malman. And then apart from Bodega Razón, you have small little wineries all across. There is one that I think is very special to mention that is called Sacro Monte. That was the investment of a, of a Peruvian French uh, family who moved to Uruguay and developed this beautiful, beautiful wine uh, vineyard that has three three beautifully designed cabins where you stay overnight, which is the hotel. And it really made the cover of Time magazine as the 100 places you have visit to visit before you die or something. Uh, wow. and, or, or this year, maybe a year or that year, not before you die, which uh, is Sacromonte. I really recommend that one. But there's also very little wineries like Sierra Oriental, Oceanica, many, many ones to visit. Grilling over and fire, you know, that's a tradition both in Europe Uruguay and Argentina, we feel that the everything is mostly cooked or grilled over fire and over wood. So there is a master of fire cooking that we um, cherish, who is Francis Malman, who put this on the map. His books are very well known. He's had these books like Malman on Fire, Seven Fires, Seven Ways of Techniques of Cooking Over Fire with Wood. And now his new book is called Green Fires for, you know, mm -hmm. cooking vegetables and more, you know, vegan and vegetarian mm -hmm. recipes. But Francis was an uh, institution in himself. I mean, he's a lifelong friend that I adore. We have the same age. We grew up with the same, you know, things. And, and I think loving the same things, you know, going to really wild places. And he's been instrumental in putting places on the map. You know, this Jose Ignacio that we mentioned as the most coveted uh, point and all of all of the Uruguayan coast, and I would say the most chic uh, beach resort in all of South America. Well, he put mm. it on the map, you know, first he established his first restaurants there in the 70s, then his very famous restaurant by the lighthouse called Los Negros. And now he has three different restaurants happening in the area. We can talk about that later, but that's what he does. Yeah. Well, I think, and for those people who are listening and not watching, um, this is not your American average barbecue <laughs> where you're throwing a couple steaks flat on a grill. It looks much different. You know, you have the the big wood fire in the middle and then dangling things above it, like vegetables or even chicken and whole heads of cabbage. And so I would highly suggest that you go check out the video to see um, what a typical Uruguayan barbecue looks like. And then I love magical settings for meals. Tell us a little bit about this. Well, this is the pop-up dinner that has been very successful this last season. This is an Argentine chef called Martin Milesi. He lives in London and he developed this, what he calls una, ephem ephemeral tables. He does it in the St. Pancras uh, Tower in London. And then he realized that maybe a Jose Ignacio would be a wonderful place to develop this in a different way. And it's done in the grounds of the beautiful forest that is behind the, one of the small little uh, hotels that have developed in the area. It's called Luz Cul Culinary and Wine Lodge. Mm -hmm. And it has this beautiful pine forest. So in that pine forest, he puts up this uh, pop-up dining table where he develops this um, um, tasting menu. But it also has, it's, there are magical nights with some theater and concert music, light music, classic music. And it happens, you can do it either for your own group, a group of, um, you know, of friends, 
or you can go and sign up for one of the evenings any day. It has a, um, in London, it does it for 12 people. Here it's tables of more 24 because it, you can do a more communal table and it's all lit with these beautiful lighting. It's quite really magical. I, I recommend it. I love it. And then more right. outdoor dining, but this time at the beach, um, chiringuitos, which is um, a more universal term than just in Uruguay. Tell us a little bit more about what chiringuitos are. Yes, I think chiringuitos were developed in Uruguay and then a little bit in Brazil and Argentina oh, and then in the rest of the world. It's what we called a little like pop-up, not really pop-up, but a, a very simple little restaurant that happens on a beach and it's like toes in the sand. And this was the new venture of Francis. As mentioned, Francis Valmont has now three restaurants in the area. This is the newest one, and it's in an area called Costa Garzon um, that has this beautiful beach. And as you see, it's very romantic. You have these little um, uh, tables and stretchers, and also they're divided. You can't see it on the picture, but they are like little thatched roofs, and they're exactly by the ocean. Everything that you eat there is grilled in his way. And it's just magical. And he's always around, so it's great, always great to meet Francis. Great nice. personality. Nice. Well, looks and more picnics. I love planning pop-up picnics for people, right? Or surprise picnics. And um, sometimes it's nice to do them by the sea, like here in a beautiful, it looks like shaded spot or at a winery or in the mountains or near the river. So there's so many places in Uruguay where you can have a beautiful picnic. Exactly. I think picnics in, in Uruguay are mandatory by the sea or, as Mimi said, in the vineyard, in the mountains and uh, in very beautiful sunset places and lookouts. And this is one of our signature experiences, you know, in my, my ten, our, our company that is dedicated to personalized trips and creating signature experiences. We do um, picnics anywhere or dinners or combinations of personalities and, and mm -hmm. fun outdoor experiences. This is exactly a dinner that we did this season for a, for a family in the Sierras of Garzón up in the mountains with the sunset happening over there and this was done by Francis Malman and it's just magical. I have to say that Francis is probably one of the best esthetes that I've ever known. He has the most impeccable taste. So with nothing, like with the simple lemons or potatoes or um, hydrangeas, I, I think I see there, with very simple things, he will create a, a magical setting. Yes, and it absolutely. He did my, for example, my daughter's wedding in Patagonia, and it was something out of this world because people came from all over the world because she's she got married to this wonderful French designer, and um, it was done in the middle of middle of nowhere in Patagonia, where people had to arrive by boat to this very secluded island or, or beach, and um, with sands of all different colors, and he created this incredible atmosphere, and with all very simple things, you know. Uh, uh, wood recovered from the driftwood and as I said just peonias but then like maybe just lemons and very very simple impeccable design. Beautiful well I look forward to getting down there so I can eat at maybe all of his restaurants while I'm there. We touched on the sunsets just another stunning you know beautiful picture of sunsets and then um, there happens to be some nudist beaches um, in Uruguay, yes. so just wanted to bring that up. <laughs> yes, you want well to now. Prepare. Yes, just a little bit on the sunset. You know, it's so important the sunset that we mentioned before that people, when yeah. we go there, they really clap when the sun sets. It's like really amazing to find that out. But the Chihuahua Beach, I think it's a quite interesting thing that developed years ago this was decades ago i was a child growing up and i would hear the people talking about chihuahua but my parents wouldn't take me there but nowadays <laughs> it's become like this you have full families fully nude fully naked there's a hotel there's a little club there's a beach club and and people even go there out of curiosity but also respecting you know what other people do and yeah. and it's interesting you know people are just chatting on the beach completely new talking about what they bought in the supermarket it's just <laughs> a natural life but with no clothes yeah and well, that happens in this very very calm sea where you can go swimming and it's just one little beach amongst other beach sites that you know mm -hmm. that happen all along the coast mm -hmm. and then marine life um you mentioned ostrich ostriches which are um, on land and obviously the horses and there's birding. But then when it comes to the water, there's places like Isla de Lobos that has a huge seal population. Um, so for people who love marine life and wildlife. And then what about the whales that come through? What's, what's whale season? Exactly. Well, you have there, well, 
starting with a whale season that happens from July to November. There are great places to go and watch whales. And this is the Southern right whale, um, which is very tame and very curious and very friendly that you can approach it. But it happens a lot in a, one of the seaside villages or in the what we call the wild east. After Jose Ignacio, there's a way to cross into this region that is called Rocha. And along these seaside villages, there's one called La Pedrera, another one called, there's a, a beach called Costa Azul in La, in La Paloma, where you're bound to see um, uh, whales. And there are some uh, islands for sea lions, like this one is called Isla de Lobos. Lobos means a sea lion, which is the perfect little island that you see from anywhere in Punta del Este with a lighthouse where you can go by boat there. But there are also closer ones, one that is uh, in Cabo Polonio, which is one of these little villages which are in the raw Rocha seaside area. And so there are different places where you see sea lions, also elephant seals, and also dolphins there in the sunset uh, with the calm sea in Jose Ignacio in that area where you see the sunsets many times I've gone swimming in the in the sunset and you and you swim with dolphins and there's also another interesting thing we have sea, sea turtle sanctuaries there's a great one and one is Cerro Verde but the other one is in a beautiful beach called Las Maravillas in La Coronilla which is this beautiful beautiful beach very near to the border with Brazil where there's a picturesque hanging bridge over these outlets that water into the sea. And you can, you know, uh, there's a great uh, area to go and learn about this, the sea turtles as well. Love it. Well, we love having lots of different opportunities to see marine life. And then when we look at, um, back to a little bit of architecture, but focused on this bridge, tell us about this very special bridge. And again, for those of you listening, you might want to Google it to see what it looks like. Um, it's really very spectacular, and I know there's some reason behind the circular shape of it. So tell us a little bit about that. Yes, this bridge was a bit controversial at the time because it's the only way of crossing from the area of Jose Ignacio that we've been talking about into the raw and rugged, what we call the wild eastern shores, where you have those of the other little villages that we just mentioned about the whales and the sea turtles and the sea lions and so on. The only way of reaching there was crossing this beautiful lagoon that is a nature sanctuary and it's called Laguna Garzon. So before we would call, cross on a barge, in a barge you would go with your car and put your car on the barge, only three minutes across. But when this area becomes starting more popular, then there were lines of cars trying to cross on the little barge. So there was a real estate developer who's also an art mecenas who's very, very well known in the area and also in Argentina. It's Eduardo Costantini, who was the founder of the Malba Museum in Buenos Aires. And he also developed some great real estate developments here in Rocha, one called, um, well, one called um, Las Garzas and um, in this area, very near uh, what we're seeing on the, on the bridge. So with, between the, the local Uruguayan government and Eduardo, they called on this wonderful architect called Rafael Vignoli, who is from, from Uruguay, but he has this great international firm in New York and is very worldwide known. And he developed this design of a bridge that would try to affect the least the impact on the nature reserve that happens on this lagoon. So mm. his idea of doing a, a round bridge is that by going on a round bridge. First, you slow down the speed of your car. There's also a lane for bicycles and even walking. And so you uh, enjoy more the natural scenery. And also at the same time, it's round shaped. So it looks like a lagoon within a lagoon. Mm -hmm. And also environmentally, it's supposed to be less uh, damaging for the, for the uh, nature reserve because it has less shade or shadows on the water. So it affects less the bird life. Wow. Well, it is beautiful and obviously very, very unique. So be fun to drive over it for sure. Um, all right, let's transition to some of your favorites. Um, we'll go through, actually I skipped ahead. There we go. As far as places to eat, some restaurants, beachside, it looks like the first couple are the favorites. Um, tell us a little bit about Marisma. Yes, the food and the wine in this area are amazing. So the food you can't skip. The first one you showed was La Huella, which is probably the most famous. You know, it's a destination in itself. People will come to Jose Ignacio just to eat in La Huella. And I always recommend to have, have at least two meals, one during the daytime at lunch and one in the evenings mm -hmm. because it's completely different. It's, mm -hmm. again, it's right on the sand and it's on the rough side of the beach in Jose Ignacio. So you can go through the beach and you're just dressed in beach clothes and it's there's a wonderful, beautiful atmosphere. 
Most everything is caught, is fished on the grill, and it's all the catch of the say. The desserts are to die for, you know, dulce de leche and chocolate and volcanoes and um, the ceviches. Everything is at the pizzas that come from the mud oven. Everything is very simple and delicious. Martin Pitaluga is the, you know, the man behind. Also, we're originally a pupil of Francis Malman, but this is a restaurant that is about with the 50 best in South America, Latin America, San mm -hmm. Pellegrino list, and it's a destination in itself. Do not miss La Huella anytime you go to Jose Ignacio. And um, the next one you, you showed is Marismo, which is all outdoors and it's all cooked over fire with a fire mm -hmm. pit. So it's very, very romantic. And the chef there is Fede, Fede Vecino, which is a wonderful, wonderful chef. And it's and its destination in itself, too. You cannot miss going to Jose Ignacio and not eating one evening in Marismo. Right. Now, if our show was six hours long, we could talk about all the other amazing places. But since it's not, we will transition to shopping. Tell us a little bit about um, someone near and dear to you and this next um, photo. Well, I have to say that shopping in all this area is amazing. There's great interior designers, uh, clothing designers, leather, all the pottery, the crafts, the jewelry. I mean, you can really spend hours going to beautiful stores that, that uh, some, what i love about all this area that there's a true love for returning to the basics to anything that is done by hand mm. uh, in the old way well this is a little bit embarrassed but this is the brand of my daughter chufi c-h-u-f-y if you google her or if you go on instagram she is an amazing person she moved to the paris and the and new york some decades ago she got married to a wonderful french designer and her brand, I love it because it's, it's inspired in travel destinations. So she's done, like she feels that she has to help the local communities of the destinations she visits. So she gets inspired on the prints, on the, um, you know, like for example, you go to Kenya or you go to Morocco and you buy some, or Thailand, and you buy some things that are indigenous and then you go back to your own place and you want to wear them, you know, like the beads in Kenya or whatever, and you don't really find how to wear them. But she thought on how to, make those beautiful designs and helping the local communities make them like more wearable anywhere in the in the world and mm -hmm. also her her idea is that when you travel to a destination you want to fit in so it's lovely to to travel to any of these destinations she's done peru japan morocco dubai arizona the last one is patagonia her first one was argentina this one that i see here is romania so this is a photo shoot in jose ignacio with those beautiful flowers by the sea Mm. And there's a, a shop that sells, of course, a her store in Manantiales, the Chufi. And also she does some pop-ups also in Jose Ignacio. So it's, I don't know if you enjoy this kind of clothing. Yeah. That's, that's something that I have dear to my heart, Chufi, C-H-U-F-Y. But anyway, Perfect. there are other great designers, I mean, that do things with the knits. Well, she's also done a wonderful cashmere collection, but there's some great um, uh, other artisans and designers in the area that do wonderful things that I can give you a list accommodations <laughs> yes well um there is just so much i mean i know that you and i could talk for hours about it so we will we're obviously the resources for people when they're planning their trip so lots more information to come if you're planning a trip to uruguay so the vic properties which they have three of i know right in this um, area near jose ignacio um, but they're all quite different do you want to give us a little bit of an overview we'll start with estancia vic which is the one that's internal not on the beach exactly there are three vic retreats they're called vic because of the founder alex vic alexander vic and his wife carrie alexander is norwegian but he grew up between sweden and the canary islands and then he went to study in boston well in harvard and met carrie his american wife and had this dream of coming to uruguay because his mother was from uruguay so they bought mm -hmm. first the first property that mimi showed which was estancia vic which is a farm which is inspired in a spanish colonial architecture and made by an architect a uruguayan architect called marcelo dalio and as you see, he has this beautiful terrain of, uh, you know, uh, green land as far as the eye can see in that lagoon. You can, like, I mean, that stream that waters into the Jose Ignacio Lagoon. And it's all inspired around art. It, it, they, they summoned all these um, Uruguayan artists to, in, to intervene each room in a different way. This is uh, how you see Estancia Vic from the inside. You have all this artwork, which is really quite amazing. The, the beach, the um, pool in Jose Ignacio in um, Estancia Vic and the next one you will show which is Playa Vic 
um, are very special. Well, this is Playa Vic, and this was a contraption, this wonderful building designed by Carlos Ott, who was the same one who did the Maca Museum. Look, it looks almost like a spacecraft, but it's called the sculpture. That Beautiful. is very interesting because it's made of glass and titanium. And inside it has this amazing pool that juts into the ocean and it's black granite. And in the, there you see it. And then the bottom, it has these fiber optic lights that um, copy the constellations in the sky. So it's very mm. beautiful to see that mm. light that boat of this pool. And it has, well, Saha Hadid furniture and it has seagrass on the rooftops and it has a pit fire. And it's just a beautiful place to enjoy the sunsets. And the next yeah. one that you're showing now is Bahia Week, which is walking distance. These are both on the calm ocean of the Jose Ignacio Peninsula. And this is like more sprawling and it has these bungalows that are on the sand dunes and oh, they're all made of different materials from wood, from uh, um, steel or uh, black zinc and all intervened by artists. So you have your own little villa on the beach and it has, it can be one bedroom, two bedrooms, three bedrooms and so on. And it has four immense swimming pools. It has a great um, yoga shack. It has a great beach club that is called La Susana, a great restaurant on the dunes to watch the sunsets. It's really amazing. Beautiful. Well, and again, very cool architecture and um, shows such a variety. So then um, to look at another property, Fasano, Punta del Este, tell us a little bit about this. I think this is maybe one of, has one of the best spas in Uruguay. Exactly. And this is in a different location because all that we talked before, you know, the, the three big properties are in Jose Ignacio. This is the next seaside uh, villages that you come, well, if you're coming from the airport or if you're coming from Punta del Este proper, you cross these camel bridges. We have two very interesting bridges that cross over to La Barra. This is called La Barra de Maldonado. Mm. And this hotel was originally the farm of a local Argentine family called the Browns. Uh, Fasano, which is this great Brazilian brand, brought, bought this property and kept the old colonial um, original farm. I think it's possible we just might have lost Maita for a moment. <laughs> so we'll see if she pops back up. She is in Patagonia. So um, it's uh, sometimes internet is a little iffy. Um, so we'll see if she comes back on. And while while we're waiting for her, you can see I'll just sort of touch on a little bit more about Fasano. Um, for those of you who are just I listening and not seeing the pictures. Like, oh, there you are. We lost you for a moment, Maita. Oh, you lost me. OK, I was saying that Fasano has this. This is the main building of the hotel that has these beautiful views and great restaurants overlooking the surrounding area. This is up on a hill. And it looks down onto this stream and uh, where there's a beach club as well. And, um, and there's these little cabins that were designed by this amazing Brazilian architect called Isai Wakefield. So for any mm -hmm. design lover, there's also a, you know, a, um, a tennis court there in this beautiful setting, the sunsets and the spa. You know, for wellness, this is a place to go. It has this beautiful spa with a great pool and overlooking. There you see it with this beautiful countryside all around olive trees vineyards yeah very special i for many people just looking at those photos makes me want to come and i love hearing all of the wonderful stories behind it and you know the richness of your relationships and your experience in uruguay um before we wrap it up let's talk a little bit about some um, tips for people who might want to come, maybe starting with best time of year to be there. I know, obviously, you guys are in the Southern Hemisphere, so you're opposite summer from us in North America. Um, but I also know that a lot of people down there are on their summer vacation, you know, in January, February, which is a popular time to come. So if somebody's thinking of coming at that time of year, let's say over Christmas, because so many of us have vacation then, how far in advance do people need to think about it? And would you say it's a good time of co to come or is it just kind of too crowded with a whole bunch of South Americans? Well, yeah, the peak season is that week, festive week of spring, I mean, of um, Christmas and New Year's. For a lot of people, it's the time to be because there's a lot of great parties and all these pop-up dinners and things that are going on that you don't want to miss. There's a great art festival and a film festival. The art festival is at the end of December in Garçon, which is that beautiful little village where Francis has a restaurant and a, music and a hotel. And it all dresses up for this great uh, art and, and, um, and food festival. Um, 
and there's some really great parties and nightlife. But if you want to be out away from the crowds, the two main summer uh, months are January and February, where the weather is warmer and there's, but there's more people too. I tend to love the pre and the post, you know, uh, November and December and even October and then March and April are super beautiful. Right now, mm -hmm. even when the fall is beginning, remember that this part of the world for the beach light, the water is swimmable, but it's not warm. It's not the Caribbean. It's not even like Brazil. It's a little more chilly. So you mm -hmm. walk in, you, into the water and you really start, you know, on warm sunny days, you swim as much as you can, but that the first touch is a little bit fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say um, all the shoulder seasons even have better, you know, rates for these great you know, hotels. So I would go November, December. And then if you want to be in the big nightlife and the big parties and everything, you, have, you can't miss New Year's. But if you want to get avoid, avoid all of that, then families tend to go more in February. January is more younger people. March and April are more relaxed, like more low key and just enjoying the atmosphere with no not having to reserve restaurants so far in advance and so on. Mm -hmm. So. I would say October to April are fascinating. But I have to say that this beach resort that started as a uh, only summer destination is now a year round thing. People go any times so and many Europeans and Americans have taken it like a second home or even um, the retirement place or a place to live because they're very good schools. There's a great campus and university being designed and built and, mm. and there's restaurants and things that are open year round. So this especially during the pandemic, there's been a big, big change. Lots of Argentines moved there to live year round. So it's a place where you can go anytime. But if you want to enjoy the sun and the good time, good, good weather, I would say November to April. And so if you're coming there with, um, you know, maybe couples who are more active and maybe a family with teenagers or college kids, what would you say with a typical week vacation, eight days maybe that an American typically has, how would you break it up? Clearly we're gonna spend some time in Jose Ignacio. Um, what else would you add to it? Okay, I think you have to fly into Montevideo and then enjoy maybe a, a night or two at the city. The city, as I mentioned briefly, has a lot of culture and life and it's by the water as well and has great hotels and restaurants and cultural life, great art. Some some uh, great artists that have museums in, the, in themselves, and and then move on to the coast, which would be uh, maybe spend a night in Sacromonte in that beautiful wine hotel if you want to have a wine experience, or in Garzón, and then move on to Jose Ignacio for the last three nights to enjoy all the lifestyle on the beach and so on. But I would always uh, consider doing a side trip to Buenos Aires, which is so near. You know, you know, yeah. if you're going all the way south and you haven't been to Buenos Aires, it's a stone thrown away. You should cross over. Absolutely. And then what I love is flying into one place and out of another. So perhaps have your arrival or your departure out of Buenos Aires and the other one out of Montevideo. And you get to see both without having to backtrack. Um, and I love, so Buenos Aires is actually very easy to get to from Uruguay flight, a little tiny, what, 30 minute flight, um, yes. a ferry. If you have a car, you can actually take yeah. it on the ferry with you. Um, and so it really is, if you've never been there, you know, such a great, beautiful South American city. You can cross by water from Buenos Aires, even if you rent a car and take it over across, or if you cross without a car, and it's a mm -hmm. three hour ferry to Montevideo or a one hour ferry to Colonia. Colonia is one of the three UNESCO heritage sites that Uruguay has, and, and what is that beautiful uh, colonial village that is worth visiting, all cobblestone streets and beautiful, mm -hmm. the small little hotel called Charco that is unmissable. Nearby you have another wine pre pre um, area called Carmelo, which has like three beautiful, there's a, a very nice Relais Chateau called Pinca Narbona, and there's a Hyatt by Carmelo that has beautiful, you know, really, really wonderful spa and a great place to enjoy uh, food and wine and, and nature. Mm -hmm. And 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 yes, and those that's the easiest way of crossing one hour across on a ferry from Buenos Aires or mm -hmm. to Montevideo or just fly to your wine 30 minutes and you're there and you have several flights a day during the season. Easy. Well, amazing food, lots of outdoor adventures, beautiful architecture, great art, cool lifestyle, lots of nightlife. There's no reason not to go to Uruguay, in my opinion. <laughs> so thank you so much. Right. You agree. Um, when are you going to be back there, by the way? When is your trip to Patagonia done? 
uh, I'm in Patagonia right now. I'm going back to Buenos Aires, um, but I have to, to act as a grandmother and go in and take care of my grandchild in Paris in a few days. But then I'll oh. hopefully be in Uruguay after that. Okay, very nice. Well, thank you so much for spending your morning with us. We so appreciate it. And I look forward to working with you many times in the year ahead and um, we'll be in touch. So be very happy to help. And thank you for everybody who's been listening. Please consider Uruguay, as Mimi said, as a wellness, nature, lifestyle, food, artsy destination. And that can be very well combined with Argentina and even with Brazil as well. Right. If you and won't regret it. It's beautiful year round. And I think that for people who just have never had it on their radar, now you have lots of reasons to put it on your list. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Maita. Take care.